I just wanted to run through some of the reasons why I got involved in a few of these issues. And I would, I would really want to emphasize that I haven't been as involved as I would like to have been. Uh, particularly when you're in a small political party, you have to try and cover a lot of bases. You have to try and spread yourself a wee bit thin. Uh, and I think if anybody in the Scottish Parliament had really been burrowing into this agenda and specialising in it, uh, a great deal more could have been done uh, to keep the co Scottish Government and other public and private bodies under a bit of scrutiny. Uh, so I don't, uh, I don't claim any great, uh, any great credit uh, for the, the, the issues that I have worked on. But before I was elected, um, I was certainly not uh, an IT uh, professional or expert or anything like it. I, I suppose from my teens I would have been a, an enthusiastic amateur, uh, but nothing more. Uh, and at that point I was still using things like, um, uh, you know, uh, Linux at home on a, on a laptop. And, uh, you know, from, from my early kind of teens uh, I would have been going along to the, the Barras in Glasgow on a Saturday where various dodgy stalls had a, a computer set up under the desk and a couple of briefcases full of, of software, uh, uh, dodgy copies of, uh, of software. But in amongst that was also kind of early public domain and shareware. So I, I had that kind of exposure to the notion of uh, a different economic model within IT uh, and a different creative model as well. Um, and so one of the first batches of parliamentary questions that I put down, written questions, uh, when I got elected, just out of pure curiosity, was around how much money is the Scottish public sector spending on proprietary uh, operating systems and proprietary software? How much of the, the information that's being produced by the, the Scottish public sector is in open document formats as opposed to proprietary ones? Uh, and a few kind of connected issues uh, around that. And it normally takes about four to six weeks for written questions to, to get an answer back from the Scottish Government. Uh, within the first week, though, I had an email uh, from a fairly senior manager at Microsoft asking if I would like to come out for dinner. <laughs> they were quick off the mark, much quicker off the mark than the Government was in answering the questions. Uh, I did meet him. I didn't have dinner. He came to my office for a cup of coffee, uh, and we had a chat. Um, and, you know... He was what he was, someone who was paid to be able to convince people like me that Microsoft takes these issues seriously. Uh, and he was, he was, you know, competent at that job. But I, I think there were, there were still questions, both about the, the private sector and the public. But what struck me about that experience was how absolutely on the ball a big private sector uh, organisation is. Even if a a newly elected backbench MSP from a small political party in a devolved, never mind independent, uh, parliament starts asking questions. They don't want to lose their market share and they don't want questions asked that might lead to that. The response from both the parliament and the government when I, I got some of these questions back uh, was largely bafflement. Uh, and I think we're still in a position, uh, you know, more than 15 years later where a great deal of the public sector, uh, including politically accountable layers of, of uh, parliament and government, don't really engage with this agenda very much. They regard it as something dry and technical and perhaps a bit frightening. Uh, so let's, let's leave it to the experts. Let's not bring political scrutiny to bear on it. This was also around the time when uh, the UK government's ID card scheme was being proposed and uh, legislation uh, had already been introduced and was already getting a rough ride and we decided because they were uh, rolling out uh, one of the pilot areas for registration on the, the, the nascent uh, ID scheme uh, in Glasgow, we decided to get involved. There was a very broad campaign against that scheme but it was in the public eye I think largely focused on cards, on the idea that people would have a card, might have to carry a card. And it's understandable that, that that kind of portrayal of it as a sort of papers please mentality, uh, it's understandable that that happened because uh, a lot of the politicians who were defending the UK government at that time would openly say things like, well, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. There was a kind of authoritarian strand uh, to that. But a, a good deal of the core campaigners against the scheme were very clear that it was the database, 
It was the way that data would be used, and it was the way that the scheme would change the relationship between citizen and state that was really at stake, not just so much the cards. And I think some of the same issues began to play out uh, later on in relation to, as Jim said, the entitlement cards. Uh, a similar concept, a similar concept to the ID database, but framed in a very different way. And uh, that, that issue with the entitlement cards and the different framing around that put me in mind uh, of an exchange from Yes Minister. Barely a day goes by in politics where there's, there isn't still a very, very relevant on-point scene uh, from Yes Minister. And this was where Sir Humphrey Appleby, the senior Mandarin in Jim Hacker's department, uh, delighted, uh, uh, announced uh, Brussels is about to decree that there's to be a new European identity card to be carried by all citizens of the EEC, as it was called then. And the Prime Minister wants you to introduce the legislation. Me, says Jim Hacker. Well, yes, you're pro-Europe, you see, and it would simplify our administration, so it's a good idea. Good idea? Political suicide. Trying to make British people carry identification papers, they'll call it a police state. Is this what we fought two world wars for? Minister, it's little more than a sort of driving license. It's the last nail in my coffin. To which the ever-loyal Bernard Woolley uh, helpfully chips in with a suggestion, you might get away with calling it Euro Club Express. <laughs> and this speaks to the way in which those who wish to collect data about us, whether they're in the public sector or the private sphere, very often seek to portray this action as something that empowers us. They may even believe that themselves. They may not see the downside. I think a great many of them do see uh, that they're in fact accumulating power to themselves, but some of them I suspect don't. And I think particularly that's true in the public sector where the attitude that this is simply a, a, this is just a simpler way of administration, a simpler way of, of doing our job. We'll, we'll increase efficiency, we'll make everything easier. I think sometimes there are individuals who only see the upside and don't see the downside. I should uh, just, uh, as, a, as, a, as a footnote, mention that all of that exchange is, is still fully copyright BBC, uh, but we have paid for it already, so I think we should be fairly okay with that. Now, around this time, when the, the entitlement cards were being scrutinised and, and, and some of the issues challenged, we took the view that there should be a set of privacy principles, that the Scottish Government should not regard this as a merely a technical set of challenges or a technical set of questions to be answered uh, by uh, those who understood the systems, but that there were deeply political questions involved uh, and a set of principles should be developed and adopted. And I'm very pleased that unlike some uh, in government, uh, John Swinney at the time agreed that that should happen uh, and a set of principles were developed and adopted. But the requirement to continue evolving those principles and continue holding uh, government to account, uh, that's an ongoing task. Simply having those principles as a document that people can uh, you know, find uh, online and, and read, that's not enough. It did take pressure to have them developed in the first place, but we can't simply allow government to leave them there. They have to keep evolving. And they have to be understood as well as a politically salient issue. Even in the, the first line of the first section of the Scottish Government's privacy principles, which states, people should not have to prove who they are unless it is necessary. People should not have to prove who they are unless it is necessary. That is a deeply political statement. It is loaded and layered with meanings. And it's a contested statement. When is it necessary for people to prove who they are? Why? For whose interest? In relation to the, the constant debate, the continual debate we have in, in Parliament between universalism and targeting, for example, for, for things like social security, targeting to its, its friends, means testing to its critics. The idea of an inclusive versus exclusive idea of citizenship and rights. These are politically contested ideas. 
We moved on uh, a little further to the issue of the, the, the proposal for the NHS Central Register. Uh, the government, I think, had noticed, actually, we've already got quite a lot of data here. Couldn't we use that for the same purposes? And the plan as originally devised uh, for the use of the NHS Register would have been a very clear breach of the privacy principles that data is collected for a specific purpose and that's only used for that purpose and the people who've given that data have consented to that purpose. But it was also a reminder that we don't only need government to understand and adopt these principles, we also need parliament to understand that these issues are part of its scrutiny role. And for the most part, parliament didn't see it uh, as relevant. And we need civil society to have access to the information about what's happening inside government so that power can be held properly accountable. More recently, we've moved on, and I think the, the Open Rights Group um, was, was uh, very central in helping to make sure that the, the, the government's proposals on the, the NHS register were challenged and scrutinised. But we, we've now moved on, and the, the Scottish government has its digital identity programme, and the Open Rights Group is also a member of the expert group uh, on, on that project. And I'm very pleased that we do have at least that open door, at least that willingness on the part of government to say, yes, an organisation like the Open Rights Group should have a voice at the table. The objectives of the, the digital identity programme include to develop a solution where members of the public can be confident that their privacy is being protected. And that sounds like something most people would agree with. Yeah, we'd, we'd like to achieve that. But as soon as you start thinking about how that can work and what it really means, uh, we, we encounter problems. It has to involve more than just the public sector, for example. It is inevitable that if this digital identity uh, program comes to fruition, it will involve private companies at many, many points in the system. Have they fully committed to following the privacy principles, even in theory? And at least as important as the theory of what we're trying to achieve will be the approach when things go wrong, which they will because in complicated systems, things always go wrong. And to think about that phrase as well, where members of the public can be confident that their privacy is being protected. Where members of the public can be confident. That's not the same as the people in this room being confident, who I suspect have a much higher than average level of understanding of these issues. It's not the same as the government being confident that they have the systems in place. It's not the same as the IT professionals or the policy managers and directors being confident. Members of the public being confident that their, their privacy is being protected. It's hard enough to convince people who are inside the bubble, people who have a high level of understanding of the technical aspects of these challenges uh, hard enough to convince them that all of these can be met. To convince members of the public means to have a sense of confidence which may be well-founded or may be poorly founded. It may be affected by the latest story about a, a lost USB drive or a, a breach of data by a credit card company. Those are the things which affect people's confidence. They might be relevant to what's actually happening in the digital ID system, or they might not. But how on earth can we have a situation where people know that their lives and their digital identity is bound up with a set of systems well beyond most of our comprehension? How can we know that and still have confidence in it? I'm not sure that's an answerable question. And beyond that, there's the question of purpose. And I come back to political use of these systems. And that has to go well beyond the current government. It has to transcend the political intentions of the current government of the day. Ministers of any political party never like to ask themselves the question, what happens after I'm gone? Political parties don't like to ask themselves the question, what happens 
when my opponents are in power. They like to think that they'll be in power forever. They never are. What happens when this power, this legislation, or this set of tools is in my opponent's hands? Something that is designed today to make it easier for people to access the services they're entitled to might tomorrow be used to exclude those who need those services the most. Or indeed to track the people who government has some level of interest in. It's only a few days ago that The Telegraph, for example, ran an article headlined, From Gender Neutral Bathrooms to Women's Prisons, It's Time Trans People Carried ID Cards. Just let that sink in for a moment. The proposal, taken seriously by a national media platform that a minority group which is already subject to high and rising levels of hate crime, should be required to carry ID cards. And that's before we consider the treatment of people in the social security system, in the asylum system, in the criminal justice system, and so on. I think uh, one of the, the uh, introducers, I forget who it was, mentioned Police Scotland and the, the criminal justice system uh, and its use of new and emerging capabilities uh, in the digital sphere, capabilities which are designed to overcome privacy. It may well be that there are circumstances where that is justified. But the use of the, the cyber kiosks, the, a tool for uh, accessing people's data, and I, I say again, just like something like CCTV, there may be legitimate uses, but there are also very clearly potential illegitimate uses. And the convener of the Parliamentary Committee at Holyrood, which has investigated this issue, said, even the most fundamental questions, such as the legal basis for using the technology, appear to have been totally overlooked. This technology, he said, was used by frontline officers without any human rights, equality or community impact assessments, data protection or security assessments, and in the absence of any public information campaign. So why on earth should people, members of the public, have confidence? Why would they be justified in having confidence that their privacy is being protected in the absence of public information about the way new technologies are being used? In Parliament, we debate these, these well, do we debate these issues? We debate an agenda connected to these issues. We debate something which is nine times out of 10 called digital participation. I mentioned at the start that there was a, a debate on that not so many months ago. Digital participation is the way it's always framed. And what that always means is about the scale of digital participation. What percentage of people are online? What percentage with broadband? How fast is the broadband? Whose fault is it, UK or Scottish government, that not enough people have access to super fast broadband? You know, the, the, the kind of consumerist mentality of this, of, of just providing more, is not an adequate way of discussing digital participation. You know, as, as a Green, we have this, this criticism around a lot of infrastructure, things like transport. Most governments like to think, well, we just want to provide more, so I'll, I'll, have, I'll, I'll build you a, a bypass, I'll build you this, I'll build you that, and I'll take a photograph of myself with a hard hat and a high-vis vest, put it on my desk of me cutting the ribbon, opening it. That's, that's the kind of provision, that, the kind of more is always better uh, approach. And we have that attitude to, to broadband. I'm sick and tired of hearing these debates between, uh, particularly between SNP and Conservative members about whose fault it is that a particular community doesn't have access to superfast broadband. And we're not asking people, asking each other how are people using their access to online capabilities. The, the pros and the cons, the huge opportunities and the risks, and what do we need to do to maximise the opportunities for everybody and deal with and manage and, and minimise the risks. We never ask about the nature of digital participation. Are we being creative in this new online space or are we merely being taught to be consumers of a new category of product? 
Are we being empowered or are we being manipulated? And inevitably, the truth is there's a bit of both. But unless we debate those questions, uh, then a digital participation agenda is, is merely, uh, uh, I think, it's a distraction uh, from the, the deeper questions that affect all of our lives. Now, a few years ago, you may be aware that Scotland had a, a debate on independence. It was in a few of the newspapers at the time. Um, one of the things that we tried to do in the Greens, we were very clearly on the, on the yes side of that debate, and I, I, I don't propose to, to try and convince anybody on, on that here. I'm sure there are people on both sides of that argument. But one of the things that we tried to do was identify some issues that nobody else was talking about. Um, digital rights was one of them. If Scotland had become independent, it would have acquired power and authority to make decisions on a whole host of issues which are currently reserved, uh, or we would have had a voice at the European table uh, dealing with a whole host of other issues uh, which are currently not within the scope of the Scottish Parliament. So this was a Scottish political landscape seeking to take on a set of powers uh, which would have affected your digital rights and the digital rights of everybody in this country. But we, we weren't really having that debate. So the, we, we published under the, the Green Yes campaign a paper saying digital rights are civil rights. Looking at a, a host of issues from uh, the idea of a free and open internet, things like net neutrality, uh, to those, those issues beyond mere access, how are people using uh, their access, uh, intellectual property, copyright and patent reform, surveillance both by state and private sector players, uh, and freedom of speech and privacy. Now, I have no doubt that the paper we produced in 2014 for that campaign is well out of date by, by now and probably uh, wasn't as good as it could have been even at the time. But it was an attempt to put some new issues onto the agenda. And I regret, I regret that we're still... I think, not quite seeing those issues uh, being taken up on the political agenda in Scotland. Because I worry sometimes that we've already, already reached uh, a sense that it's too late, that the genie is out of the bottle, that a great many people all know that our friendships and our gossip, our shopping and sleeping patterns, uh, our political leanings and our sexual interests uh, are just sources of data under the control of players we don't even know about, haven't even heard of. You know, the, the sci-fi fantasies that I used to read as a kid, uh, you know, the idea that you would have a, a little device in everybody's pocket that would give you access to the sum total of human knowledge at the touch of a screen, or allow any two people to connect with each other in a moment, what a great, liberating, enlightening, empowering fantasy, which has turned into a horrible bin fire. As a society, have we already decided subconsciously that it's just too complicated to understand, let alone control? I've been given a, a sign saying five minutes, uh, and I, I haven't even touched on democracy yet. Um, I was going to say something about Trump. I was going to say something about Brexit. I was going to say something about Zuckerberg at Congress the other day. Hopefully, you'll have time to debate these, those, these things during the day as well. I'll just mention the referendums bill that's going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment. We don't yet have a bill saying there should be another independence referendum. Personally, I would welcome it. But this is a bill that sets framework legislation for all future referendums. It's an opportunity to start dealing with some of those questions about online campaigning, about the use of manipulation. And yet, although there is some discussion by the Electoral Commission and the Scottish Government about these issues around things like digital imprints, I fear that we're still only going to start treating digital campaigning as though it's the online equivalent of a, a leaflet posted through somebody's letterbox. Just put a, an imprint on it and that'll be fine. Actually, it's a far more sophisticated set of tools um, being used in a far less transparent way than leaflets being posted through letterboxes. Can online campaigning be regulated in the same way as offline campaigning? Should it be? 
Are there ideas for how you would achieve that which don't impinge on legitimate freedom of speech but do regulate the manipulation of people and the manipulation of truth? I don't know the answer to those questions, but I think we're in an extremely vulnerable p position at the moment with the rise of right-wing populism uh, around the world, the rise of manipulation, the, the post-truth society, uh, and um, the, the, the clear opportunity for that manipulation to continue uh, and to increase. And we haven't answered these questions. I want to, I want to end with um, something hopeful. So uh, there is currently a plan for a citizens' assembly the beginnings of the, the deeper use of participative and deliberative democracy in Scotland. I hope that you, as fellow members of, of the Open Rights Group, as citizens who are concerned about digital rights and privacy, use that Citizens Assembly. Whether you know someone who gets involved with it or not directly, you will have the opportunity to feed into it, to put issues onto the agenda there, which are not subject to the whims of political parties uh, or the self-interest of politicians because we're all as bad as each other, really. The, 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 the rumours are true. You'll have the opportunity to put issues onto the agenda in the Citizens' Assembly, which I think will offer the opportunity to think in a deep way, in a creative way, about issues which our politics is not yet resolving. And that absolutely includes this agenda. So I hope that the Open Rights Group will engage positively with the Citizens' Assembly uh, on that issue. We need to be conscious. And I, I'll close just with, with a reference to this, this theme for the conference that was in my briefing. What sort of questions uh, governments and developers should ask themselves when adopting or developing technologies to understand their social impact? I think we need to be conscious of the fact that most people won't understand. Most people are not going to suddenly become experts in what is an extremely complex and sophisticated field. That's okay. People shouldn't have to become experts. But it's quite possible that even amongst experts, nobody will have a clear overview of it all. Like law or medicine, we might specialise, but complexity has reached a point where it prevents anybody from being a complete generalist. So power in this field, power will always be hard to democratise. That needs to be our challenge. How is power held accountable in our society? Uh, not held secretly uh, by a priesthood, either of law or of, of IT. If we want the idea of living in a democracy to be meaningful, power has to be held accountable. And that's a challenge where it, which I don't think any of us have really understood yet, let alone answered. Um, I said I was going to end with something hopeful. That didn't sound like it. <laughs> But thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm only sorry that I can't stay for the whole of the day, but I, I will uh, speak to, to colleagues afterwards and, and find out about the discussions you've had. Uh, I think maybe we have time for some questions, do we? One or two questions? If anybody would like to fire something at me, uh, I'll give it a go, and if I can't answer it, I'll take it away and think about it. Actually, we've done that as well. Didn't even do that. There you go. <laughs> Um, there was uh, a paper, mm, it might, it's, it's somebody who ended up in the UK cabinet, it might have been somebody like Douglas Alexander, uh, a long time ago, it must have been 15 years or more ago, uh, about uh, open democracy, uh, about how new systems, which were only beginning to emerge there, might allow people to sort of crowdsource democratic scrutiny, how things like legislation could be held to scrutiny uh, through online platforms. Um, it is something that's got potential. It's also something that's got potential for being manipulated as well. Um, so I think there is a, a, a huge opportunity. I mean, there are, there are little examples of, of how individual politicians can do that. You know, if, if I go to a meeting with the, the bus company, for example, in Glasgow, if I tweet that I'm on the way, then half an hour later, by the time I get to the meeting, I have effectively crowdsourced the scrutiny questions that members of the public want me to put to that organisation that has power over their bus services. 
Um, there, are, there are little individual ways of, of doing that. I don't think anyone is yet, um, as far as I'm concerned, systematizing that or, or you know, doing that in a, in, a, in, a, in a systematic way. So there's potential, but there's, there's good and bad potential in there. What, one more? No, I haven't. Uh, I don't know anything about that, but I would love to learn. So if you want to drop me an email um, or a tweet or something, I'll happily look at that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think we're, we're kind of a little bit tight for time. So thank you very much again for the invitation to, to come and speak to you. Uh, and I hope you have a fantastic and really productive and creative day. Thank you. <coughs>